We're excited to be able to partner with Zymedica to host this event, District Hall Venture Cafe Providence, uh, along with NEMIC, and um, offer, it, offer it up to the public for the first time. This is very exciting. Zymedica has conducted this meeting as an internal monthly information sharing platform since 2014. As a company that partners with leading medical device, pharmaceutical, and diagnostics companies to design, develop, and manufacture solutions for the healthcare market, innovation is at the core of everything they do. To be truly innovative, Zymedica understands the need to be highly familiar with the evolving technologies, gadgets, and innovations that have recently come into the public domain. These monthly forums have proved to be an effective way of collectively sharing, disseminating, and discussing these developments and have the potential to spark ideas on projects they are working on. This innovation can then be passed on through to the clients that Zymedica partners with and in turn to the healthcare sector as a whole. So we're very excited for those reasons to be able to host it and offer it to a broader audience. We were able to offer this event to the public today through a partnership with Zymedica and the New England Medical Innovation Center. NAMIC is a medtech venture studio that supports early stage medtech entrepreneurs and startups round out their business in preparation for successful fundraising. For any medical innovators or entrepreneurs on this call today or viewing this recorded program later on, um, between the capabilities Zymedica and NEMIC offers, there is support right here in Rhode Island to accelerate your technology to market at any stage. So at this time, let's turn it over to our host today who has been doing this since it began in 2014, Jessica Peach a principal of research and product strategy at Zymedica. Welcome to our inaugural May edition. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. I, I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, let me share my screen here. Uh, can you all see? I think you can. Let me know if you can't. All right, so I, I, we do this on a monthly basis. Um, I'd love to have feedback and um, I'd love to also have contributions because then that just makes it a richer, more uh, collaborative exercise. Um, and Zymedic has been doing this for, uh, as uh, Jimmy said, uh, in quite a number of years. And we find it was really um, a very good way to be inspired um, on various different projects that you may or may not be working on and uh, see kind of a reflection back in terms of the um, uh, opportunities that you can, you can think through to um, expand better your, um, your, the, work, the, the work that you're involved in. All right, so what we cover in this monthly forum is that we, um, in terms of areas of interest uh, to us as a collective, um, thinking about um, primarily uh, medical devices, but um, pulling in analogies and um, examples from other industries that have potentially a medical application down the road. So there's a number of different categories we look at. Um, this is an expanding and contracting uh, list uh, over the years. Um, it includes things like materials, sensors, robotics, um, and we just recently last month added um, a special category or at the times of COVID-19. Um, there's been a lot of in innovation just around uh, supporting uh, the, that particular issue. So it made sense to incorporate that as a new category, at least for uh, the, the next uh, few months. All right, so I'm gonna jump right into materials. Um, this is the format of the page in terms of we have the, the uh, category at the top of the page and uh, an explanation I kind of do this in the Petra Kucha style, but uh, there's a, a description or a name associated with the innovation, where the innovation has come from. And sometimes there's a contributor, in this case, it's Kaven, who is our director of engineering. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can get a sense on the right-hand corner, the kind of the phase that this particular innovation is in. Um, and then there's a brief description. And if you wanted to access the link um, to where this article, where the article, the source for this information came, it's down at the bottom of the page. So. This first innovation is called the EGAIN polymer, and it comes out of Carnegie Mellon. And this is a soft stretchable polymer composite um, that has electrical and thermal properties. Um, how it works, um, and I always give a little bit of description around this, it, um, and it usually involves me pronouncing some very unpronounceable things, so bear with me, a eutectic gallium indium, which is a metal alloy um, that is, has the capability of being liquid at ambient temperatures. So a metal alloy that's a liquid that now can have a, a seeping through essentially a polymer that can create a little bit of magic. 
um, there's a technique called atom transfer radical polymerization or ATRP for short. And what this technique does is it works at a very nano scale to combine monomers, which then convert into polymers, and then a brush with these EGAIN droplets, enabling a liquid metal to kind of uniform, uniformly disperse and suspend across the polymer material. And then what you end up with is this soft, stretchable polymer um, that has the ability to um, conduct electricity. Um, and this is very exciting as a new material, uh, a completely new material that we've never really had an experience with before. You can see it being incorporated in wearables, soft robotics, artificial skins, uh, and potentially other biocompatible uh, medical devices coming out of the academic lab um, space, of course. So it's going to be a while till we see this one in the market. Next material um, also has applications for diagnostics. This is a flexible MRI radio frequency coil um, developed out of Purdue University. So if you've ever had an MRI scan, uh, you uh, may have experienced a, a, a situation where the particular body part, whether that's a head for the brain um, or another body part, um, when it's been imaged, it has to be strapped down um, to very rigid and uncomfortable radio frequency coils. And that strapping or that, um, uh, that uh, securement um, is a one size fits all and it's really quite uncomfortable. And MRIs, if you've had one, you will know that they often go for an extended period of time and it's all round unpleasant. So this new innovation is uh, taking the idea of some a little bit more flexibility, uh, but also enabling for conductive, uh, a, a, a conductivity so that the MRI a machine knows where and what they should be doing, what it should be doing. So using a conductive silver coated thread that's uh, in a very simple, to me looking at this as a sewer, a basic zigzag pattern, um, has the ability to flex and stretch. And so therefore it could be incorporated into a wearable garment. Um, and then also because of that flexibility can get better placement to the body, which then can improve the MRI image quality. quality. This is particularly valuable for when you think about breast MRIs uh, for detecting cancer, thinking about uh, the various different sizes of breasts and also obviously density, that's, uh, that makes for a lot more complicated imaging, particularly for MRIs. So actually, does this mean that my breast mammogram is actually going to be more pleasant an experience? <laughs> Can't wait for this one. All right, so the next material is uh, also in the context of skin, um, but now we're talking about replacing sutures. This is a tissue closer tape tissue closure tape that comes um, out of MIT. Kaven also found this one for us. Thank you, Kaven. This is um, inspired by the sticky glue that spiders use to catch their, their prey, um, as opposed to sutures for rapidly healing uh, uh, skin tissue together or wound tissue together. So they tested this material in animal studies and they found it can bind lung and uh, intestine tissue, which are pretty thick, um, uh, uh, tissue, uh, tissue layers in a really quick amount of time. They can also, um, they expect that they can also use this, uh, this tape to attach an implantable to the heart. Um, so again, less sutures there. So how spider adhesive works is it has charged polysaturides in it that absorb water instantly. So that absorption clears off a dry area so it's better prepped for optimal adhesion. So they're using, the MIT uh, folks are using this double-sided tape in a similar way by using, instead of uh, that polysaturide, they're using a polyacrylic acid, which works in the same way to suck up water and then form a hydrogen and covalent bond with the tissue proteins in about a five second period. So uh, pretty remarkable and uh, very meaningful in terms of um, improving suture, uh, the tissue closure experience. We have ourselves seen um, uh, increasingly surgeons moving away from sutures and using things like staplers, but of course, um, but of course that um, has also trauma to the, to the body. So as more optimal um, we can get this, um, the faster we can, uh, it, uh, the faster we can uh, complete cases as well as um, a faster wound healing and therefore recovery and getting people out of the hospital sooner. The next material is actually more like a technique um, and interesting one from an academic team in Germany. Um, called the Chanel Technique. Um, and this is a, actually a collaboration between uh, multiple universities uh, in Germany, particularly in Munich. Um, and they've, what they've done is they've developed a way to make organs like a kidney, an eye, a thyroid, or a pancreas transparent to better enable anatomical examination. 
And what this technique is doing is it's using a t detergent that I've never heard of co before called CHAPS. I presume that stands for something, but what the detergent does is it pokes holes through the organ um, and enables the clearing, uh, the clearing of the compounds um, so that uh, those compounds uh, essentially seep out um, and this detergent now uh, can uh, embed into the organ itself. So this is not a live, uh, a, a live technique. Um, it's for examining an organ, maybe if you want to look at the pathology um, of a specimen as an example. <laughs> Um, this technique allows for uh, the cells to be identified by type and, and with a particular specialized laser scanning microscope and computer, you can then analyze and map those cells with the 3D rendering as shown on the image here. Another material, uh, now moving a little bit more into uh, some technologies and communication, uh, this Wi-Fi chip from UC San Diego is uh, able to connect a device, think of any IoT device like an Amazon speaker at home, online with 5,000 times less power draw than what we're commonly using today. Um, compared to a grain of rice, it's a lot smaller. A grain of rice is literally this white blobby thing that looks huge, <laughs> it looks like a new speaker. On the page and uh, the, the chip itself can transmit at a rate of three megabytes in a second, um, so pretty high fidelity and it, and, uh, it has a range of uh, 69 feet. Um, it uses what's called a back scattering technique to encode new data that's coming in an incoming Wi-Fi signal before transmitting them, so it makes it much more efficient. Um, and so we can expect a lot, a lot less battery burden, which means smaller sizes of IoT devices. When we start to think about implantables in the body that may be needed to connect, um, Bluetooth to, uh, via Bluetooth, uh, maybe an outside app. Um, now we can be even more, uh, uh, more nano in our, uh, in our sizing. Um, I am also very personally interested in uh, renewables and. Uh, um, in terms of solar and uh, wind energy in particular. Um, but uh, so, we're, so when I see uh, new energy efficient um, opportunities, I definitely um, try to incorporate them into this. So this is a solar efficient quantum dots. dots. If you've not uh, come across quantum dots before, that's a whole other <laughs> probably webinar um, for education purposes, which I won't go into. But this is coming out of University of Queensland, Australia. Um, they have uh, explored the idea of uh, flexible, inexpensive quantum dots to act as essentially a photovoltaic alternative to silicon and the silicon pa panels that we're used to seeing for solar, uh, uh, to collect solar energy. But these quantum dots are lighter in weight and potentially thinner, thin enough in order to make those panels um, transparent. So now potentially we could be incorporating more solar energy um, capture in our windows, for example. So traditionally quantum dots um, have performed at a much lower power, power, solar power efficiency compared to silicon because they've got a very rough and unstable surface. That means that it's just much harder, there's a lot uh, of energy lost as it's trying to collect, uh, collect that power. But a new surface uh, engineering manufacturing technique that's coming out of uh, this university have developed a way to really control that surface using um, some functional chemicals on those quantum dots. And that uh, they've uh, arrived at achieving a 25% more efficient pathway for electrons. So it's not the be all end all, it's not going to replace solar power any, solar panels anytime soon, but um, very interesting as they um, expand and make, uh, uh, make this innovation more and more uh, relevant for us. Right, moving into uh, sensors, and in some uh, of these categories, there's an awful lot of overlap between different categories. So we have sensors and a diagnostic and a digital health product in this particular um, innovation that's coming from Massimo. Um, who are very uh, deep into this particular category of pulse ox oximetry. This mighty sat RX spot check pulse oximeter is the first fingertip pulse oximeter that can measure respiration rate. So when you see a patient with uh, one of these things on their finger, it's typically measuring heart rate, it's measuring um, you know, the, 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 the level of oxygenation in your blood, but um, this one is taking it to a whole nother uh, level in terms of uh, data that's able to collect through a technique called resp respiration rate from the PLEP, RRP as the acronym. And it doesn't require manual counts or chest electrodes to be collected to collect the data, which then frees up the patient um, for a more pleasant experience. 
Um, this device in particular has been indicated for both in clinic and hospital and home use. Um, it's small in weight and at 100 grams, and it uses two AA batteries that last for um, 1800 spot checks. Um, it connects via Bluetooth for easier tracking and uh, data sharing, commercially available today. Um, also staying in the context of sensors, this is a stress diagnostic sensor by Caltech in California. So stress is uh, something that we're all going through on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe more so now than ever, um, but it's very difficult to measure objectively and also accurately. Cortisol, cortisol which is a chemical um, generated by uh, our steroid hormones, does, is there is a close tie uh, to, uh, between cortisol and our mental states, including depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And cortisol can be detected in blood, um, but blood tests themselves are stressful, and uh, it requires you to be with a doctor who can do a vena puncture in your arm and pull out that blood. Um, so this particular sensor is able to do that, uh, collect um, cortisol measurements non-invasively by detecting uh, levels of sweat in the skin. The sensor uses a porous 3D graphene structure which contains cortisol antibodies that then detect the opposite of what they are, the cortisol, and it creates an electronic signal that can be picked up by the sensor and then sent uh, to a computer or an app nearby. Um, if you know me at all, you know I have a love of animals, um, and so sensors shouldn't, shouldn't just be for humans. Um, and I love the fact that Imperial College London has figured out how to make a fur-friendly monitor. Um, you know, obviously, the wearable sensors that have been uh, pretty pervasive in the marketplace today are, um, don't really work with fur because it relies on really good skin contact. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of animals who have fur can't, uh, it's difficult to achieve that. So this is a stethoscope-like device that has it's made from a combination of silicone um, and water and a microphone. And when it's applied with a strap to the fur of an animal, um, it's kind of squishy kind of surface is able to adhere to the body without any air bubbles. And that microphone can pick up a heartbeat as well as a respiration rate and then convert um, that audio into a digital signature and then send that to a computer nearby. Um, they expect to be able to use this uh, technology to monitor a pet during surgery, but also maybe more interesting, a bond sniffing dog to track their physiological responses when they get close to an ex explosive so that um, you don't actually trigger the explosive, but uh, they, you can tell how excited the dog is and therefore narrow down your search. Ophthalmic contact lens sensors. Contact lens has come up quite a lot in this tech forum um, over the years. Um, the Chinese Academy of Sciences um, has uh, been exploring the idea of a smart contact lens that's able to change color when it detects a particular um, abnormality in the eye. In this particular case, they've, um, they're seeking an indication for dry eye and glaucoma. So the hydrogel within the contact lens contains a PHMEA polymer that in its original state appears red, but uh, the nanostructure itself changes blue in a low moisture setting to indicate the dry eye and appears green when intraocular pressure, aka glaucoma, is high. Um, and so this could really provide very real-time point of care um, for ophthalmologists. Um, currently, the technology uh, takes 30 minutes uh, for the contact lens to change color. Um, so one's interest level in waiting for that long uh, to get a diagnosis versus some of the other machines that an ophthalmologist might have available today is uh, less desirable, but it's interesting that there is an exploration happening in this space. And all the various different things that contact lenses can now do. Um, also in the context of sight, or in this case, non-sight, um, this is a very interesting technology coming out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Kayvon also found this one for us. This is a, um, a way to identify around corners and to be able to see hidden objects using special light sources and sensors, or even being able to see through a gauzy filter to reconstruct a shape of an unseen or hidden object at a millimeter or even a micrometer level. Of course, DARPA would be involved because they want to find you know, various different things hidden in various different places. Um, but this idea of non-line of sight imaging works by leveraging laser fired pulses of light that actually reflect off of a hidden object and bounce off of walls and other objects. 
the scattered light created from that reflective, uh, that, that reflection is usually washed out by the more powerful light sources that our brains and our, our eyes can detect. But this NLOS technology can extract that scattered light and separate it out from the more powerful light sources with, use, with the use of sensors to replicate what that object is. And they've demonstrated a proof of concept by reconstructing an image of a, a U.S. quarter, which is the reconstructed image that they've been able to create through this NLOS imaging is on the left hand side. It's not great. It's a little fuzzy, but you can tell that it's a quarter. You can tell that that's uh, Washington's head. And on the right hand side, an example using line of sight imaging um, with the same technology. You can, though, imagine, I'll go back for a second, you can imagine, though, if we can start to use this for imaging of medical devices um, or uh, imaging of uh, medical anatomical issues that we're trying to explore, this could be very interesting. Of course, we have to get some form of light into the body in order to uh, be able to support this, but I can see this evolving in a lot of different ways in the future. All right. Next sensor device. There isn't one tech form that goes by and has a sleep tracker in it of some form or other. This one comes from, uh, from Better, um, great name, uh, and their product is called Sleep Tuner. It's FDA approved, which is a, actually an unusual thing for a sleep tracker, um, available in the marketplace today for 149 49 bucks. It is a postage stamp size, uh, essentially adhesive patch that sticks on your forehead. Um, and uh, that area obviously is flat and well vascularized, so optimal for enabling something called photoplasmography, <laughs> PPEG sensor to accurately monitor blood oxygenation, blood oxygenation and heart rates. The device has a accelerometer in it to track tosses and turns as you sleep. And um, they uh, made the decision as a company to seek FDA approval um, be, because then they could then incorporate it as part of a physician's diagnosis of things like sleep apnea and as have it be as a uh, prescriptive tool to help uh, monitor for treatment efficacy. Uh, so interesting uh, kind of business model that they, they have going on here. The app itself, of course, collects and presents the data on various different aspects of your sleep um, and helps you kind of improve uh, sleep quality based on recommendations that they have. Next sensor device is uh, for multiple sclerosis and um, this particular product, the MYO Band, actually was initially developed for video gamers to be able to have gesture control, control as they play uh, various video games. Well, they've now found that there could be another application for this very uh, non-medical uh, device to be uh, relevant for multiple sclerosis. This particular disease state is one that has symptoms that fluctuate um, and of course progress over time. And the clinical checkups that may be happening maybe once a quarter, once a year, are really not tiny enough to really pick up new symptoms. And so there's a delay, there's a lag in identifying your treatment, uh, identifying your symptoms with um, actually getting the optimal treatment that you need. So this product is one on the arm and has accelerometers, gyroscopes and electrodes, it's kitted them all out, um, to really detect electrical nerve impulses. And they, uh, the particular team that was involved in this uh, conducted a study with over 100 MS patients um, who used uh, the product to do a series of finger and foot tap exercises for five minutes a day. And it was found to really be much better at detecting subtle changes in motor function and muscle strength than a clinical, clinical visit um, on every quarter for obvious reasons. So and a great example of how, uh, you know, video gaming can actually convert into uh, saving people's lives or improving people's lives. All right, this next sensor, pa uh, sensor, sensor device is also a diagnostic, but in the form of supporting athletes. This is a smart paddle developed by a Finnish team called Trainee Sense. Um, it's worn on the other side of the fingers, as you can see on the um, image here on the right hand side, and it's essentially tracking the quality of the swimmer's strokes. The sensors are able to measure the magnitude, the trajectory, the direction, the timing of the force as your hand is applied to the water um, and can identify uh, um, and send that information to a coach sitting um, on the side of the pool so that there's real time performance uh, data that's being collected. The device can identify if the, sw uh, the swimmer is actually pushing down too hard at initial water entry. And so you can imagine someone like Michael Phelps really getting a, a lot of value and use out of, uh, out of a device like this, commercially available um, for 359 bucks. 
Um, also saying in the context of athletic performance and sensors, Calibrex X1 system is, was developed by a pro fitness trainer um, and is intended to help um, you uh, achieve better performance as you're lifting your weights. Um, it works with ultrasounds to detect if a barbell is not being lifted symmetrically um, and uh, collect stats uh, on your behalf. So there's two sensor units, one that's put on either end of the barbell um, that attach magnet magnetically. And as a user lifts and lowers the weights, a transceiver um, in each unit sends ultrasound pulses down to the floor and then measures how long it takes for that pulse to reflect back up um, for real-time processing. So if one side of the barbell is higher than the other, um, a beep in your earbud would alert you into, to help you correct uh, your posture and your, um, your performance. Um, the app also tracks, of course, lift velocity, reps and rest times to um, help you set goals for yourself. And they're seeking Indigo funding for uh, 249 bucks at uh, when they get actually eventually get to market. Um, this one I have put in, even though it's not really related to medical, um, I still find it interesting because I could see how it could uh, uh, evolve uh, to be uh, more relevant in the healthcare space. So this is a localizing ground penetrating radar, or LGPR for short, also coming out of MIT. This is a technology that allows for vehicles to detect road markings and changes in the surface when they're not visible, for example, under snow or under the skin, maybe. I'm thinking in the future, electromagnetic pulses are admitted into the ground and then reflected back up um, based on obje underground objects uh, that may be there, such as rocks or roots um, or even snow, of course. Um, when they, this MIT team have driven the car on the same exact road, um, this uh, technology is able to compare readings to the previously recorded same drive um, in either better or worse conditions and able to inform the driver of how to better perform. Um, and in the test that they've done, in a closed course test, they found that um, this uh, technology is able to perform within a margin error of one inch. So if you think about you know, driverless cars, um, this could actually be uh, much more safer as a technology working with some of the other adaptive technologies that have already been embedded in um, those self-driving cars. All right, shifting a little bit into um, the user interaction area, um, as well as uh, also sensor devices and disability devices. This is a visually aided tactile enhancement system also coming out of China. Um, several medical conditions like diabetic neuropathy, infections and then injuries can actually cause a patient to lose their sense of touch. And when you lose your sense of touch, it can affect how well you walk and how well you notice wounds and injur injuries present on your body. Again, spiders have come to the come to the um, to the champion line here in that um, understanding how spiders' exoskeletons work to feel the slightest of movements on their spidey webs. This tech um, enables a person to feel with their fingertips. So um, the device works by having this ultra thin cracked based sensor strain sensors. They're embedded in this a layer of silver, as you can see on the image uh, on the bottom right here. When the silver is flexed, those cracks create a change in the conductivity of the metal, and that can be detected in real time, and then be converted into a, amplified into a stronger sensation uh, that can be then converted uh, into signals to the brain potentially. Um, and so there, and you can imagine this maybe have uh, benefits for gloved users, um, particularly clinicians in a surgical environment, maybe some great haptic feedback that we can start to incorporate into some of the more robotic systems that are out there which is one of the big nirvanas that we're all trying to seek to uh, for those in the robotic space. Right, moving into um, other robotics, um, the snake bot. Snakes are not my best friends, but um, interesting that there's, a, uh, there's some learning that we can get from them. John Hopkins University um, has been seeking to develop a, a robot that's essentially a search and rescue. That's, that's its intended application. Um, to, and they were inspired by a particular cape snake called the king snake that has the ability to undulate and cantilever to navigate very different types of size obstacles, including climbing of stairs, as you can see on the image here on the left. Um, and how it does is actually really fascinating. The front section of the snake can lengthen, the middle section can stiffen, and the rear section shortens to allow for that reach out 
and um, uh, movement, movement up at the same time. So this academic team has kind of taken that learning from the king snake and uh, adapted it into a robotic capability uh, to take on more complex surfaces over 3D terrain. So if you think about what this could mean in terms of robotics in the body and how we might be able to move through, um, for example, um, the GI tract uh, to get to a particular area of treatment, um, that, that, that could be very meaningful once they start to uh, reduce down the scale of the, of the product. Um, also in robotics, bees. Bees are having a really hard time right now. Um, in California, apparently farmers rented two million beehives last year to pollen pollinate almond blossoms. And if you're someone who's drinking almond milk, then you want to pay attention because there is a 61% spike in almond milk sales and bees aren't able to keep up. Um, they're struggling to stay alive, as we've seen in all the reports, because of pesticides, because of viruses, because of um, those big hornet things that are eating bees um, from an article seen last week. So, but beekeepers are reporting, reportedly losing 38% uh, of their colonies, um, and that was last year, and that's the highest rate ever been recorded. So bees are having a problem, and the status quo is not sustainable. So here enter Edit from Edit, which is a, a robotic development company, uh, out of Israel, and they have developed an artificial pollination robot. The process is pretty cumbersome and labor intensive, in my opinion, but the process starts a year prior by harvesting almond tree flowers and then separating and storing that pollen for the next season. Once they've collected, harvested that pollen, um, it is then put into these uh, robots and the ro pollinating robots then use LIDAR sensors to position themselves next to the blossoming tree and then spray harvested pollen at the branches. And that pollen has been um, charged with an electrostatic charge so that the pollen better adheres to the tree and then starts to create those albums that we're enjoying in our milk. They've done pilot testing in Israel as well as Australia and hoping to expand to California too. In the context of environmentally friendly trash disposal, um, Clean Robotics, um, as a startup um, in the US, has um, been seeking to solve the problem of use error, namely that people don't throw away their recycled, recycled materials in the correct pathway often. Um, and it makes for um, a lot less value um, in the recycling materials that end up uh, in, uh, in the processing uh, pathways. So this trash bot um, can be used like any other trash bin, except it takes a little longer to throw away your trash. One piece of time is disposed of, and uh, the trash bot essentially goes through a process of recognizing it, identifying it through a series of uh, data uh, sensors, that then send I data about the item to software that then classifies it and sorts it into the prep bin. Um, it takes three to five seconds for it to do this process for each item, which, you know, they're working on it, um, but good upstream recycling could actually mean that materials could have more value and be more likely to be reused. And they're even hoping, they're planning for future models to allow for compost sorting. Um, so even less goes into the trash. And they piloted this at uh, Pittsburgh Air Airport. So if you go through Pittsburgh Air Airport, try it out and let us know what you think. All right, diagnostics. Um, in the context of um, children and autism, this is a handheld eye scanner that um, claims to help with earlier diagnosis of, of the, on the autism spectrum. And this is important to essentially better empower families um, to get um, earlier therapy and the earlier therapy you can get, um, the better you are as a, as a patient individual. So this device allows clinicians to non-intrusively obtain light adapted electro retinograms, which are the elect electrical signals in the retina to detect subtle activity, um, which apparently is a very a reliable biomarker for neurodevelopment. Um, the device has been tested in 180 kits um, and compared to scan results with a very high degree of accuracy. Um, for uh, th this particular product, is a uh, VistaScan is essentially a mobile ultrasound that interfaces with any smartphone or tablet to display and manipulate live images produced by an ultrasound. Of course, this um, makes for a much more mobile platform, a much more user-friendly platform, um, and you can imagine this being uh, very helpful for clinicians like EMTs or folks out in the field in more remote places where uh, having a full um, ultrasound system uh, wheeled to a, a bedside may not be very practical. They've got an FDA approval, and this is a startup that's coming out of the University of Arizona. 
Another diagnostic, also in the context of remote um, and uh, um, uh, folks out in kind of more remote areas and developing countries, um, Diagnostics for the Real World is a, a company or an enterprise that is really looking to um, support um, or more, more remote and developing uh, markets. The, this product called the Samba 2 is an evolution of their first product, obviously Samba 1, is a point of care portable diagnostic device that detects for infectious diseases including HIV and HCV. Um, the automated system uses a nucleate, nucleic acid amplification to detect for viral RNA or DNA in whole blood or plasma samples. It, single, it uses a single-use sealed test cartridge, as you can see on the right-hand side image, um, that contains all the consumable, consumables needed for an assay, and one drop of blood from a finger stick um, is uh, then placed into that cartridge and the cartridge is inserted into the device, um, where you see the four devices on the left-hand side. Um, there's an assay model that connects to a tablet computer. So the actual device itself, one of the things that makes it easier, less expensive uh, to use is that there is no screen, no interactions on the device itself. And all of the controls of the user is through a tablet um, that then can also read the results with very minimal training. The device runs on battery power if needed, um, if there's a, um, a power outlet, power outage, um, but also for um, areas where there is no power at all, commercially available today. Um, I threw this one in because I saw an email from a friend of mine the other day asking whether the mushrooms that she'd found out in the real world could be picked and eaten. Um, and it got me thinking what was out there. And I came across this article uh, just you know, very soon afterwards and sent it to her. But um, if you are ever uh, uh, out there <laughs> picking mushrooms for whatever choice, whatever purpose you choose to use them for, um, this is a fungi toxin test by the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Um, so obviously some mushrooms are fatal, uh, have am amatoxins that are fatal, um, and in actual fact cause 100 deaths annually worldwide, so it's not a great incidence rate, um, but there are many more that obviously are needing to seek urgent, urgent medical attention. So this portable test has come out of that need and is able to detect the amatoxins in a matter of minutes. It uses a lateral flow immuno immunoassay uh, test um, that's highly sensitive, um, uh, working with a reactive monoclonal antibody. A mushroom sample, um, even as small as a sign of grain of rice, can be used, and the test is able to identify toxins in urine of someone, including a dog who has consumed the fungi. Um, Maybe useful out in the real world. All right, shifting gears to talk about therapy devices. This is an adjustable prosthetic heart valve um, developed out of Boston Children's Hospital. Um, children who have congenital heart diseases um, really have a lot of challenges in that it's not just one prosthetic valve that they had to go through a procedure with. And of course, that's a high risk open heart surgery. But that implant has to be replaced every few years as they grow, poor things. So this is a valve design that works with a variety of di diameters and can be adjusted by a balloon catheter without that open heart surgery. Um, the inspiration for this came from looking at deep leg veins, which have two flaps uh, by, leaf by a leaflet, um, essentially, and that those two flaps are able to maintain flow even as veins expand in response to heavier blood volume. So inspiration from another part of the body. Um, they're planning for human trials for next year. Another therapy device called the MAG-NI from Rice University. Um, this is in the context of power and communication for implantables. Um, and so currently, implantables, particularly in the brain, are wired, uh, are connected through, um, connected to um, enable power and communication through wired connections. That's not that great if you're a Parkinson patient or epilepsy patient that are relying on, on an implant for therapy. So this new tech is actually powering and programming a neural implant by integrating a magnetic electric transducer with a CMO, CMOS uh, semiconductor to convert a magnetic field into electric current. A belt is worn, or maybe another device that holds uh, the, out, the external unit is that's strapped to the body, um, and then the, power, the implant can use and convey that power and deliver signals uh, without heating the surrounding tissue, obviously. If we're talking about the brain, you don't want to be heating things unnecessarily um, in, that, in that anatomy. So the tech is uh, pretty powerful, it's pretty efficient, and it's pretty high fidelity and cheap. So um, we should expect to see this come to market soon for those folks um, with those particular disease conditions.
Um, the next uh, uh, therapy product is called the Wound Bioprinter by University of Connecticut. This is a, um, essentially a pen that uh, delivers a biocompatible fiber scaffold gel directly into a wound bed to support rapid, rapid, rapid wound repair and volume, volumetric muscle loss. New cells created in the body are able to attach that scaffold and grow. And because the gel is actually naturally adhesive, it can stay in, the, in place without suturing. And if we put in those uh, double-sided tape that we saw from MIT, we probably are pretty golden. The, the technology actually requires no wound modeling prep or scaffold printing outside the body. You just uh, apply that scaffold right there and then, um, and it molds to fit, uh, fit the area that you're working with. And they've gone through animal testing. Obviously, our next step is to explore um, some human, human trials. Fist assist, um, uh, lots of S's in that spelling of that word. Uh, this is a device used to widen a vein diameter in prep for a fistula patient, which is something that patients that have hemodialysis uh, need to have in advance of that therapy. This product is worn on the arm twice a day for an hour for up to three months prior to the uh, fistula creation procedure. Um, and in that one hour wear duration, um, the device is applied intermittent compression um, to the uh, cephalic um, vein that is the vein that's used to create a fistula and then that uh, compression slowly increases the size of that, size of that vein over time. Um, they believe that this fist assist could also be used after fistula replacement to essentially help the vein maintain its size as well as to be used um, during dialysis sessions where obviously um, uh, blood is being transferred into the body and putting uh, more tension um, on those veins. They've gotten CE mark approval for this product. Um, a couple of uh, technologies in the delivery space. This one is the HydroPIC um, by Ascular Access Vascular. This is an antithrombogenic central line catheter. Um, it's uh, interesting because it has a bulk hydrophilic material that prevents clogging um, as a result of a neutral surface charge and it being the, the material of the catheter itself is rich in water. And this means that proteins and other bio burdens don't stick on the surface and therefore is less likely to cause thrombosis or a bloodstream infection. For those who track um, HAIs or health hospital acquired infections, this is pretty meaningful because central lines are one of the bigger ones. Um, this product comes with an improved insertion mechanism to make it easier and more intuitive to place. So you're stuck less as a patient by a, a movie nurse. They've got an FDA approval for this. The other drug delivery is in the context of diabetes um, and those folks who have to carb count and uh, figure out a specific insulin dose they need to give themselves as a result of what they've eaten. Um, and if they don't do it right, uh, there are pretty negative cons consequences, hyperglemic shock and all the rest of it. So this is a bonus calculator that's been developed by Companion Medical. It removes the complexity of figuring out what your insulin dosing is by considering your current glucose levels using something that they're calling active insulin, which is basically the idea of insulin that's still working in the body from the last administered dose. And the, this calculator that can um, provide an estimate, a more accurate estimate uh, based on those, uh, those kind of basic um, inputs. So the system works with a smart pen and is, the connected app is then able to calculate doses, issue reminders, track insulin, and send reports to caregivers based on your progress. Got an FDA approval for it. All right, COVID, COVID-19. Um, we last month featured um, a, a exploration that I think was uh, happening in New York and being sent to Boston um, of how to safely test people um, uh, without having bringing them into the hospital and exposing them unnecessarily to other people's germs. Well, this uh, South Korean hospital called Yangi has developed the safe assessment and fast evaluation technical booths Yangi stands for safety um, as the acronym. So this is a booth style, uh, phone booth style um, unit that allows medical staff to examine patients from behind the safety of a clear or plexiglass panel. Um, the booths have negative air pressure to help uh, prevent uh, particles from moving around or circul uh, circulating unnecessarily. And in a seven minute process, a patient can step into the booth for a rapid consultation by intercom. As you can see on the image on the left, they're talking by phone. Um, and uh, with an HCP, um, they can take nose and throat samples using arm length rubber gloves um, built into the panel. It all seems very kind of crude at this point, but it's really interesting uh, to me that there's you know, various different uh, ways that uh, folks are exploring uh, the way of minimizing contact 
um, and uh, making the whole process as efficient as possible. Stay home safe. This is super controversial. And in fact, I saw an article uh, this morning that Apple and Google have taken this technology and applied it, or parts, parts of it have applied it to a new app that they are releasing and are making available for individual countries. Apparently, there are 22 countries that are looking to incorporate that new app. But this product is called the Same Home, Stay Home Safe, uh, developed out of a Hong Kong academic team, it uses geofencing technology to essentially monitor those people who are under compulsory home quarantine. In Hong Kong, people who are in quarantine, so be thankful you don't live there, have been required to regularly report in their real-time locations via instant messaging and also answer surprise video calls from communication centers. And of course, all of that is rather costly um, because it involves a lot of humans doing a lot of work. So this new app works without those human beings, uh, with using an electronic Bluetooth uh, wristband that can actually detect if the individual is in compliance with home orders by picking up the environmental signals of where you are typically stationed at home. So it takes in Wi-Fi information, Bluetooth and cellular data in your own dwelling space and is able to define that signature fingerprint of your combination of different devices and uh, uh, Wi-Fi locations that you're typically using and then alerts the authorities if that signal, that combination of those elements varies notably. And of course, this is controversial because, well, it's, there's a whole load of privacy issues associated with it. But the fact that Hong Kong um, was, uh, was building this out and that a lot of countries are saying to Apple and Google, I kind of think this might be a good, good idea for our citizens um, is a matter of trade-offs and it's kind of coming. Another type of contact uh, or tracking device um, is maybe a little bit less burdensome or um, it falls less outside the lines of privacy. This is called Proof of Health by Estimote, a uh, Polish uh, company. This includes a range of wearables that enhance workplace safety for employees. You have to be co-located at work. They have to work at, work at the workplace while maintaining social distancing by providing contact tracing. So the hardware includes a GPS location tracker, um, and works with an ultra wide band radio con connection, Bluetooth and a rechargeable battery and built in LTE. Um, when a user does through a manual control changes their status from I got it, meaning I've got COVID, um, it then sends updates to all the other people that have also been in contact in proximity um, and a location data history to the relevant folks based on uh, uh, whether it's the ed actual individuals or the employers that they can tell um, uh, um, uh, alert their other employees who've been in contact with that individual. Patient Management Biosensor Patch 2A. Uh, this is an evolution um, of a product that Life Signals has already come to market. They're looking to fast track this as fast as they can to market um, because they believe it's obviously going to be very important for uh, patients. Um, they believe this patch can um, with, it's a single use, it's a wireless bio, biosensor patch worn on the chest for up to five days. It's able to record temperature, respiration rates, ECG heart rates and movements in real time. Um, it's sent to a paired app for clinical review and essentially if the, if the symptoms develop in terms of difficulty breathing, um, higher temperatures, the data phone can inform an HCP who's intending, trying to take care of a patient. But because this is now a, a, a worn, on the, worn on the patient, potentially that patient can go home um, if they've had uh, non-COVID symptoms um, and essentially get them out of the ICU, um, but still monitor them uh, for, uh, for the disease state that they were, they were in. So <clears throat> Life Signals is uh, looking to get this to market as fast as possible to alleviate the burden, particularly on ICUs and hospitals around the country. This one is really very interesting. I'm just paying attention to the time. We've got a few more minutes left here. This is the Exovent Negative Pressure Ventilator. If you were around in the 17th century, you would be aware that there was this thing called the iron lung that worked by essentially a airtight cylindrical chamber that had a diaphragm that was hooked up to an electrical motor. And when the motor caused the diaphragm to expand and contract within that airtight chamber, it also enabled the patient's chest to rise and fall and therefore get, uh, enable the patient to breathe. Well, this very innovative group of um, academia out of the UK have uh, proposed that this might be a way to better support patients with COVID, issue, COVID issues and would otherwise be on a ventilator. Um, the benefits of this uh, pretty creative solution is that it doesn't require intubation. 
So the patient can be awake and they can take their medications and they can eat and drink and they can communicate with loved ones, maybe by phone. Um, and it also means that, that, that all of those um, uh, consequences essentially can mean that their clinical care can get them again out of the ICU. This uh, academic team is seeking UK government approval and they believe that they can uh, create um, a whole bunch of these pretty darn quickly once they have that uh, green light. Um, we are all trying to find out about antibodies and whether we had well, whether we had it or not. Um, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibody test by Ortho Clinical Diagnostics is also trying to get fast track commercialization. Their product is helping to identify people who fought off COVID without knowing it. Uh, so those kind of hidden carriers, if you will. Um, so that particularly immune immune clinical staff can go back to work and care for uh, the people um, who have COVID, and it can also potentially help us better understand the virus and how it's affect, affecting public immunity levels. The test spots antibody bodies that are produced in, in response to COVID nineteen, and uh, the the test can be run on one of Ortho's Ortho Clinical Diagnostics Immunodiagnostic Systems, which is the big uh, big old set of cabinets on the right hand side of the of the image here. Um, with a new assay, 150 individual tests can be performed on one of these lab instruments in, the, in an hour. And the antibody test is being brought to market um, at who needs it first, uh, gets uh, the bulk of the, of the supplies. And they're also pursuing regulatory approval in parallel. So uh, they're proceeding at risk um, with a high confidence level that they'll get it through uh, the FDA. Um, this product, for those of us who have uh, been involved in um, uh, UV light uh, and disinfection um, systems. This one's pretty interesting. White Titan from ReSystem in Hungary. Um, New England Journal recently published uh, a report about this, that the COVID-19 virus unfortunately can survive for hours or even days on different surfaces. Well, this White Titan system is a spray that bonds at nano level to the surface. In this case, um, a subway car. Um, uh, you know, maybe the, the panels or the poles that you hold on to. And when in contact with light through a photo cal cal um, catalytic uh, reaction becomes active and can remain so for up to a year on any surface, no matter how many people touch it and how many times it's cleaned, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's already in pilots in Germany um, and uh, looking to expand out to other areas in Europe, um, but I'm sure a lot of people would be interested in this. Right, David Copeland, um, one of our uh, design directors, or CID directors in Minneapolis, uh, flagged this article for us. Um, if we're fed up of wearing masks and bandanas, uh, it's, it's heartening to know that there are designers on the job uh, trying to figure out better solutions. The Airwave by Frog and the DHH mask project by a designer um, at 3M are exploring different um, face mask designs um, to improve the generic product. <coughs> Of course, a tech form isn't a tech form without a few of the her category, which is what are they thinking? And this is really for our, uh, our amusement um, and to put a smile on our faces at the end of this. Well, this is a designer, Max Steffendorf, who is um, based in England. And he's proposed an alternative solution for the global demand of surgical face masks. And it goes without saying that, <laughs> don't try this at home because it won't work. And Mike Metz, also an engineer in Minneapolis, uh, found this one for us. Uh, we can thank our lucky stars that we live in the decade or the era that we do because <clears throat> there used to be a vintage mask that enabled you to protect yourself from influenza and smoke at the same time. And this particular article provides some instructions on how you may adapt your influenza mark to enable that uh, the enjoyment of a cigar, cigarette or cigar with the use of corn plasters to cover the necessary or create the necessary hole. The inventor originally decided that no exhaust vent would be needed in this said mask um, because he concluded there was double enjoyment derived from smoking the smoke a couple of times as you breathe it in for the first time and then breathe it out and it's following around your mask for a second time. All right, the last uh, of the technologies out there, there's sometimes one that makes you think, okay, I'll why you know, is there really a business model for this one? Well, Candle Touch uh, is seeking Kickstarter, Kickstarter funding um, for those folks who think of a candle being lit is a hassle. The candle has real wax and a real flame, and it can be lit by Bluetooth. The base has a rechargeable battery along with a refill wax body that screws onto the top of it. 
and the body is a cotton wick that is surrounded by the wire, a wire, wire coil. And when that coil is activated from the smartphone up to 60 feet away, the base can send an electrical signal up the wire, causing it to heat and hopefully light the wick and not cause a fire in your house. There's even a password protected app to be able to light 10 candles at the same time. And it can also offer reminders to the user to put out a candle once uh, a certain amount of times that. So, uh, golly gosh, uh, who thought that that would be a product that we'd all need? So uh, we save these tech forms um, on a, uh, a very large folder at the Zymedica team site. If you're interested in accessing the archive, uh, please reach out and let us know. Um, we plan on our next tech forum being on the 18th of June. Um, I encourage submissions, uh, send, us, uh, send me an email and I'll make sure to include them next time.